Here are our speakers. So we'll start with the third panel dedicated to national question in contemporary Europe. Um, the idea was that after a rather general discussion, we go to concrete cases, as much as we can do within a limited time of hour and a half. Um, um, I, I also talked to my, to my panelists. We agreed that after lunch, we should have a more dynamic exchange, meaning that our panelists will talk for 10 to 15 minutes, and then we'll, I'm sure you'll have many things to add and many questions to ask. We'll continue our discussion, then another maybe round of, of, your, of their comments. Uh, uh, anyhow, we want to engage in a rather, uh, rather uh, intensive exchange, both of information and analysis. Um, the national question the, used to be something quite, I mean, often used in Eastern Europe rather than in the Western Europe. Whereas today we face uh, within the European Union two powerful nationalist sentiments, independence movements uh, from Scotland where I work and live and where, from where Peter Gagan comes um, uh, to Belgium uh, our, our second speaker uh, is professor at University of Leuven, could tell us more about that, but could also tell us something about Central Europe, which is the focus of his interest. And then to Hungary, as, a, as central as Central Europe can get, but also close to, to the Balkans, uh, where many recent changes are putting on the agenda precisely this national question in a rather problematic way. And uh, Gaspar Tamas will talk about this. Uh, many of you know him, and you, uh, you certainly know, know his, his work, and we are very happy to have him here to conclude this circle around Europe, mapping the national question in the first part of our panel. So now I'll ask Peter Gagan, the, uh, to, to tell us something about the UK case, or the case of uh, the United Kingdom, rather interesting situation. You all know about Northern Ireland and, and um, Good Friday Agreement. You might not know about the recent developments there, but you also probably heard about the referendum for independence of Scotland that will take place next year. So I would ask Peter, who, who did a PhD on, on these issues and who, as a journalist, wrote extensively uh, about it, to tell us something more about what is going on in the UK, but also to share with us his insights into uh, a rather uh, more of a left-wing approach to these issues. Peter followed a recently event called the Radical Scotland, where the left-wing parties in Scotland basically uh, supported uh, the, 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 the independent Scotland that in their view should be more legitimate, more democratic, more social. We'll see the, 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 the picture is much more complicated than this, this, so tell us something more about this, Peter. Thank you, Igor. Uh, okay, well, I, as Igor mentioned, I'm a journalist, so uh, I fear I'm not going to have too many wonderful theoretical inputs into the debate, so I'm just going to tell you lots of things. Uh, which hopefully you'll find quite interesting and some bits of analysis as well. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is Scotland and as Igor mentioned we're going to have a referendum in September of next year on independence. And it's going to be the first time Scotland has ever voted to leave on whether it should leave the United Kingdom. Um, and just a little bit of background to that, that's been kind of, uh, the lead driver on that is a party called the Scottish National Party who are the biggest party in the devolved government in Holyrood, in, Scot in Scotland and Edinburgh and one of their big policies as the name suggests, the Scottish National Party is independence. But they've been very gradualist on independence, they've kind of been around for, well they started almost 100 years ago, they got much bigger in the kind of starting in the 70s when there was North Sea oil was discovered. Uh, originally, they were often called Tartan Tories, uh, which is a reference to the Conservative Party. They were always seen as a, quite a conservative party, uh, seen as very much Scotland owned. Uh, that's slightly changed a little bit recently. Um, they have quite. A, they're they're now seen as a social democratic party. They have quite a lot of what will be social democratic policies: free tuition fees, maintaining the NHS, the health service, free prescription fees. 
But they've all, they've also have uh, kind of tenets that we see as kind of neoconservative. They are very in favour of low tax, low corporation tax, following Ireland's model. Uh, they're very much in favour of the European Union and things like that. The other interesting thing about uh, the Scottish National Party and the whole independence, I think it's something that's really missed outside of Scotland and inside of Scotland with the independence debate is um, Scottish independence is very much a top-down affair. There's not a huge amount of grassroots drive for independence. There really, I've been living in Scotland for 10 years, there never really has been. In the same way, I'm not saying it's an illegitimate move, but if you look at Catalonia, you had 2 million people on the street last year talking about independence. In Scotland, we had a similar rally around the same time, and it was 8,000 people. Uh, Scotland's four and a half, five million people. So there isn't a huge groundswell of, it's very much a top-down approach coming from the Scottish National Party. Um, traditionally, the left in Scotland has been actually very much against independence, and now it's becoming more ambivalent towards it, I think it's fair to say. The Scottish left would have seen that uh, independence has been anti-solidarity. And so as the British left in general would have seen independence for, for constituent states within the UK as, as breaking up the solidarity of the unitary state and that it was a very internationalist outlook. That's kind of changing now, I think, because there's a, an assumption across the left in Scotland and actually in, in Britain in general that um, Westminster, the Westminster model, we, have a very, we don't have proportional representation in the UK, so we really have, a, we have had a two-party system that's become a three-party system and might become a four-party system, as I'll touch on a little later. But um, we haven't really, we, in that context, there's, there's a kind of a sense of, there's a tiredness about Westminster politics, a very, very strong tiredness, which I think is shared across Europe at the moment. And uh, there's a feeling amongst many that, that it's beyond reform and that some on the left, particularly in Scotland, see that, um, that independence might be the best way to have a new state where you can do your own thing and you're more likely to realise this, um, this kind of uh, this vision you have. The other interesting thing about Scottish independence so far is that a lot of the left-wing rhetoric has been very consciously nostalgic, I think. It's been very, and also about keeping hold of what we have. It's, some of it is about you know, designing a, a socialist future, but a lot of it's about ring-fencing things like the NHS, like the health service, ring-fencing education. A lot of it is, is very kind of education-centered. Oh, sorry, I will speak more slowly. Um, so yeah, uh, as Igor mentioned, Oh, too fast. Apologies. I'm Irish. I always speak quickly. Um, oh, yeah, so the Radical Independence uh, Convention has been a, kind of a broad church move to get all people who are pro-Scottish independence, especially on the left, together. Um, and they held a conference in Glasgow. Um, okay. Uh, they held a conference in Glasgow uh, last winter, and there was 800 people which is, is a lot uh, for the Scottish left. Uh, the Scottish left has been in a bad state for the last 10 years. Um, there was a party called the Scottish Socialist Party who were quite successful, a Trotskyist party, um, and they imploded uh, very, very badly uh, in a series of sex scandals and just, it was quite a, a messy, messy end. So the, the Scottish left has been in a bad situation in that respect for about 10 years. Um, and a lot, I think, on the left see Scottish independence as an opportunity for a, a new state. I must say, I, I don't share all of that, um, that assumption. There's no real reason, in a way, why Scotland should be any more left-wing or right-wing than the rest of Britain. There's been some social studies that hint that Scotland might be slightly more social democratic. And Scotland tends to vote for Labour and the SNP who are both left of centre, broadly, parties. But um, to say that there's a settled will in terms of socialism in Scotland, I think, is too far. Um, and I think one of the, the, the disappointment of the independence debate so far, I think, in Scotland, and for the left as well, I think it's been a problem for the left, is it's all been about constitutional questions, about process and constitutional. Will Scotland vote yes or no? Will it join Europe? Um, what would the constitutional future of Scotland be if it votes to stay in the UK? We haven't had much discussion about economics. We haven't had about alternative economic models, about what kind of economy we'd want to have. There hasn't been much discussion about environmental issues, about sustainability, and there hasn't been a huge amount of discussion about social issues or, or, or either. And I think, I think that's been quite unfortunate. It's still been a very elite-driven process in Scotland. There is a certain um, 
there's a certain amount of enthusiasm on the ground amongst independent supporters, but at the moment in the polls, it's polling 30% for yes and maybe 45, 50 for no. But it's still a long way before a vote. But I, like in, in terms of where it's going in Scotland, I, I think there's, that does separate it out from some other um, movements, is that elite-driven nature of it. Um, and Igor mentioned, I think, what's interesting for me, one of the most interesting things about Scottish independence um, that hasn't been commented on upon much is Northern Ireland and its impact on Northern Ireland. Um, Northern Ireland is only 12 miles away at the shortest crossing. Uh, and there's a huge history of migration between the two, the two parts of the country, between Ulster, the north of Ireland, and Scotland. And if Scotland was to vote for independence, that would really change the dynamic within Northern Ireland. I, I believe, although some don't believe that, but I think it, it has to. You would have a, a state, a UK state, with just England, uh, a small principality, Wales, that doesn't want to be part of it, but can't afford not to be, and Northern Ireland. Um, at the moment, as Igor touched on as well, you've probably seen stuff in the news, again, about Northern Ireland. i probably reached here. It always reaches everywhere when any, everything, anything happens in Northern Ireland. Um, but we have a government after the Good Friday Agreement that's made up of Sinn Féin, who are the party of the IRA, and the Democratic Unionist Party, who are quite a hardline Protestant party. Um, and I think it's really fair to say that the Good Friday Agreement was a holding position for the two islands of Ireland and, and Britain, that it, it, in terms of constitutions, it kind of put the national question in cold storage. It said, we can't really decide the national question now. We're going to decide to share the state. We're each going to have power. Both con communities, nationalists and, uh, nationalists and unions can have power. And we're not going to think too much about the constitutional question. And I think that's these unresolved constitutional issues are starting to bubble up again within Northern Ireland. Um, Recently, we had this ongoing flag protest, which is, I think is still going on, about the flying of the Union Jack over Belfast City Hall, which created lots of loyalist protests on the streets, caused a lot of disruption. It was a bit of a nightmare to be in the middle of, as I was for a while. Um, and I think that's, it's really highlighted some of the unresolved issues. And at the same time, you have dissident Republicans who are armed and are threatening to kill and are wanting to fight their way to a united Ireland. And, I think the prospect, if you want to ask about the prospects of the left in Northern Ireland, I think, I think it's, quite a, it's quite a sorry tale, as it, as it long has been. It, traditionally, Northern Ireland has always been, has, has traditionally for long periods been very much dominated by religious questions. At times, there has been cross-community, Catholic and Protestant, working class, solidarity, particularly in the 1930s, but always it was usurped and and political class did always use some dirty tactics to ensure that it didn't continue for very long. And I think now we're at a stage where there's, there's, not, there's very little cross-community working. The only cross-community party is very middle class, the Alliance Party, very much wedded to a, what we'd say is a neoliberal liberal economy, but they're, they're a very liberal party in every sense of the word, and it's not a working class party. And there used to be a party called the Progressive Unionist Party who were allied with a loyalist paramilitary group called the Ulster Volunteer Force. And they were seen very much as a party of socialism as well. Much, and it cost them votes, but that's changed as well. They've come out and with the flag protesters and are talking about the erosion of British culture, the end of our identity. A lot of words that were resonating in the Balkans as well, I think, about culture, identity, and what it means to belong, and very, very nationalistic ide ideas around identity. And I think that's... that's um, it flags up the reality that politics in Northern Ireland is a very sectarianized business. It's very much, um, and at the same time, you have a, as, as with the rest of the UK, but it's exacerbated economic problems in Northern Ireland, very high unemployment. Uh, the manufacturing industry is completely gone. It's call centers. Uh, they, they, they're really, especially during the Thatcher government, Northern Ireland's economic uh, future was pretty much kind of uh, done away with this. It's dependent, it's a war to the British state, and uh, that's, that's a very big problem as well, is this, this re inability for uh, economic development within the context of Northern Ireland. Um, and I think, so what I'm trying to say is that there's kind of, uh, ah, yeah, so there's, there's, obviously there's issues across both Scotland and Northern Ireland that are uh, cross-cut, but I'm actually gonna st to end with a particularly kind of, uh, with a word of even greater caution, which is the rise of uh, UKIP, which are the United Kingdom Independence Party, who you might not have heard of. Um, they've now, 
Yeah, they've now emerged pretty, they now look like they're emerging as the fourth or even the third force in British politics. They polled 25% in the local council elections. They're a very hard right party. They're very neoliberal, but also they're very reactionary. They're pro-British, but they also speak to a kind of a sense of Englishness that England feels. I think there's, there's also a sense within England that uh, you're having these moments in Scotland and Northern Ireland and that England feels slightly uh, as if it's being left out as well, a certain constituency, a very much on all, again, often a very working class constituency. And I think their success is, is quite dispiriting. And I, I think, it, I, I'm not sure what it says about the left, but I definitely think it flags up the failings of uh, the social Democrats in the UK to kind of build any kind of uh, lasting or even kind of uh, mobilizing force around it, particularly in the Labour Party. And, uh, I thought it was quite interesting in the Financial Times yesterday, John Kay, who's not exactly a man who's writing I would often come to, but uh, he, uh, he flagged up that uh, you know, the financial crisis in 2008 was, was a failure of, of both politics and economics. And then I think it's fair to say in, in the, thinking about the UK and, and the rest of Europe that in the years since, uh, democratic politics has struggled to handle this aftermath of this collapse. You know, we've struggled to figure out what's the best way to do things. We've, we've been ruling by diktat, whether it's from Brussels or from Westminster. And I think the, the left has struggled because, as he said, it's not any, actually derived any benefit from the crisis. And I think you can see this. You can see this even though the Labour Party aren't in power in uh, the UK. And you can see this in particular in Ireland, where, where the Labour Party, the Irish Labour Party, are part of a coalition. That it feels, I think, a lot of de social democratic parties after the crisis which in many ways, a lot on the left have been waiting for this inevitable crisis of global accumulation, etc. Where, oh my God, this is happening and I'm the one holding the baby here. What do I do? And instead of going, right, well, I have policies, I have, I have beliefs that we've kind of worked through in the previous years, we just shoveled money into the black hole of the banking sector. And social democratic parties were as guilty of that, if not more guilty, than other parties. And I think that's been a big issue as well across, um, I think it's been a, a big problem for the left in, across the British Isles in terms of reimagining what it might mean. But uh, yeah, so that's, that's the, uh, the prognosis from my neck of the woods. <laughs> Delivered too quickly. Yes. So thank you, thank you very much. This was very, very informative and, and I, I'm sure very useful. Uh, um, it's not a very optimistic picture, isn't it? It's I'm not a very optimistic person. Yeah. <laughs> now, now we'll see. Now we'll ask uh, Peter Vermersch uh, uh, to tell us something uh, uh, about national question. As, as I mentioned, you, you know, you have several hats. You came last year to present your project that you did with David van Reybroek, who is also here at uh, 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 G1000, uh, Deliberative Democracy Project. This year you are participating with us as a co-organizer of this conference, Subversive Literature, that will start this evening and continue tomorrow. You are all invited. We'll discuss the engagement. What does the engagement mean, social, political, or any other? And, but here, you'll talk about something that is much closer to your academic interest. So, go ahead. Thank you very much. So, when Igor asked me to say something about the national question, I thought, this is rather abstract. What should I talk about? And then I thought, maybe I should translate it into the question about what it is that constructs these days national outsiders or, or outsiders of the national community. Um, and this is something which I think we can see a little bit across Europe. There are interesting variations uh, in that field. It used to be the case, uh, the classic picture, that in Eastern Europe, national outsiders were created because of borders moving across populations. And that in Western Europe, the national outsider was created by people moving across state borders. So you had migration and immigration in, in Western Europe and the changes of state borders in Eastern Europe and that created all sorts of problems, political mobilizations uh, surrounding um, the creation of outsiders in the national realm. Now, I think that in the current context, we see that the picture becomes much more blurry and there are um, other ways in which populations are being framed and articulated as not belonging or not fully belonging to the national uh, population. 
Um, and we see that migration is becoming a topic in Central and Eastern Europe, and that the moving of state borders is becoming a topic in Western Europe, such as in the, in the case of Belgium, as you know, there is a, a, a large political party in Belgium which actually wants to create a state border in the middle of the country. Um, so in fact, what we are seeing here is the invention of national outsiders, you could say. And I want to say a few things about that. Um, not everything, perhaps a lot of the things uh, that could be talked about will appear rather in the discussion than in my presentation. But I, say, I want to say a few things particularly um, addressed to the activists who are facing with um, um, the problem of trying to speak in the name of the national outsiders, of people who are brought outside the national community who are, want to um, uh, defend their interests, who want to mobilize them, who want to oppose certain policies, and so on. And um, so, as I said, it's a large problem with a, a lot of varieties, and so I'm going to restrict myself to two very specific examples, hopefully a little bit surprising, um, so that they can sort of uh, spark some more discussion. First, I want to talk about LGBT communities, um, gay and lesbian communities, mostly in Central and Eastern Europe. And then I'm going to talk later on about the Roma, in, mostly in Central and Eastern Europe, but also in, in Western Europe. Um, in various countries, um, and so specifically in, in Central and Eastern Europe, um, gay and lesbian populations are made into outsiders of the, na of the nation. And we see this often happening in a number of countries where law and order parties um, become uh, powerful actors. And it seems to be a very effective technique um, because apparently a lot of the people inside the population adopt that frame and they will quickly say, these gays and lesbians, they don't really belong to our nation. And one country in, in particular springs into mind and that is Poland. In Poland we have a case of a country where there is a general agreement uh, on a lot of things in the policy realm with direction of uh, substantive policies in the field of, um, uh, um, for example, um, market, market policies. Uh, uh, you would have almost no strong left-wing politics in Poland. You have a strong central, centralist, neoliberal uh, political uh, force. So you would have a lot of agreement on that issue, but you would have severe and divisive uh, disagreements on uh, symbolic politics. Um, and in particular, the Law and Justice Party, which is sort of the law and order party in the Polish case, discursively, on a lot of fields, um, creates a division between, on the one hand, real Poles, and on the other hand, unreal Poles. You have to take into account that Poland in itself is quite a homogenous country. Still, that party wants to um, make very strong divisions between certain groups of the population. And in order to advance a conservative agenda, um, the focus is very much on ethical issues. So LGBT populations are made, are put into the camp symbolically of the unreal Poles. In other words, they are made into a national minority. And this is very interesting because the trope of national minority politics is very common in Central and Eastern Europe. So all sorts of politics that sort of automatically comes with national minorities, namely they represent the interests of a foreign country, they don't really are loyal to our own uh, political um, um, national question and so on and so forth, that it becomes all very easy to mobilize. Now the fact is, and this is my little jump to the activism side, is that it becomes very difficult in the Polish case to engage in activism for anti-discrimination, for example, regarding this group, because it does, in a lot of ways, confirm the underlying national minority frame. And there's an additional component to that, namely the EU. The EU very much um, pushes a country like Poland in order to adopt all sorts of uh, measures with regard to anti-discrimination and pro-tolerance, that activity of the EU is often framed as an external help um, to a non-national group inside the country. So it's really sort of portraying the EU as an ally of the gay population, which is a very powerful trope in the Polish context. Okay, so then my, t my second example, and perhaps that's even more telling, and it's certainly more pressing, um, and that's the plight of uh, the Roma in Europe. 
Um, and this is in general, as you know, a, a, a population or a group of populations, several populations you could say, um, that very often find themselves in very dire circumstances, uh, situations of extreme poverty, um, social exclusion, and so on and so forth. Now, while you could think uh, that in essence, it's perhaps a very straightforward problem, namely state policies should address poverty, unemployment, public ill health, discrimination, and so on, all the problems that these people are facing. Um, and thus, you could say that the state should be attentive to problems facing the Roma as they should be attentive to problems facing any other population group, any other citizens within their country. Now, in reality, it seems that there is a strong tendency in these last two decades, in fact, but we see it very strongly in the last few years, a tendency to invent the Roma as outsiders of Central Europe, as outsiders of national populations in Central Europe, and thereby policymakers often try to push away their own responsibility for addressing the problems that face this population. So they say, the Roma don't really belong to our national population, so others should be responsible for them, and others are responsible for their particular behavior. Now, the question that I want to ask now about the activists is how should activists who want to improve the situation of Roma deal with this state of affairs? And I have to make a little digression here because there is a complex history uh, behind that. Namely, what's at stake here is the category of Roma itself. The name Roma is functioning these days as an overarching group name employed to replace other overarching group names that sound much more negative, such as Gypsies or Tsigan. And that category has in the past been overburdened with all sorts of meaning. Even from the 19th century on, a series of very influential gypsy experts, so-called gypsy experts, with the authority of academic license, have established the idea that there is a central, essential, unchanging core to what constitutes gypsy identity. Basically, that they are outsiders. So it's in fact what in the 19th century started as an exotizing exercise became in the 20th century um, a, a, a central uh, policy point. Um, earlier in the 20th century, gypsies were discovered as a sort of internal European primitives um, with a very troublesome follow-up history in the eugenic movement and in Nazi Germany, but also in the communist regimes. Very interesting, they often banned all sorts of ethnic designations they were ostensibly anti-nationalist, but still organized society along ethnic lines, particularly with regard to the Roma. The, often, the Roma were often categorized as a separate group within the societal structure. I think Hungary, of which we will hear more later, is a, is a prime example of that. Now, an echo of these old ideas are heard when you listen to present-day policy solutions uh, with regard to the situation of the Roma. Um, in Eastern Europe, as well as in Western Europe, one example for it, um, Western European policies related to immigrants from Central and Eastern Europe to uh, Western Europe um, who are Roma. These policies are often framed in a different way uh, because the population at hand or the population uh, at issue is uh, Roma. So for value, a lot of policymakers, the fact that these people can be categorized as a sort of an exceptional group eclipses the particular circumstances in which these people find themselves. And so the policy solutions are pursued, that are pursued take into account the Roma element, but they do not take into account official citizenship or socioeconomic position and so on. So there's, it is, you could say that, despite the fact that many of the people themselves do not identify themselves with a transnational Roma minority at all, um, they are still categorized in that group. And it seems to be that the policies that are being developed to address that problem usually start from that frame, as if they are a non-national group not belonging anywhere. And the results are very problematic. Um, for example, although in most cases, the people that move from east to west and who are Roma are basically on the look for economic opportunities, um, and they're usually originally socially as well as geographically very immobile populations because they're too poor to migrate. Um, but they're still treated from a policy perspective as nomads, as people who do not fit into a national structure. Um, 
And even more concretely, I have a, a, there's a very nice example from a few years ago um, at the time of the Kosovo crisis when Roma refugees were arriving in Italy um, as a result of the conflict. They were not put in refugee camps, they were put in nomad camps. A very strange phenomenon if you think about it because these people had never traveled before, never migrated before, uh, only at the time when they, they, they became refugees. Um, so, and you have that in other fields as well, the, the perception that Roma choose for poverty instead of, because it's part of their culture and so on, so that you have to respect that as a non-national group and so on and so forth. So, to sum up, there is a sort of a strange coalition here between policy makers on the one hand in the current context and the legacy of 19th century thinking about Roma and popular stereotypes. And this leads to sort of policy proposals and solutions which are entirely ethnicity based and put um, a minority, the con construct the Roma as an external minority and put them out of the national context. Um, and that's very strange within a European context, if you think even more about it, because symbolically the Roma are very often put into the camp of the external elites, namely the camp that the European Union and all the European institutions uh, support but not the camp of the population, the national populations. So we get this strange combination of, um, of EU support, which then feeds into even um, more discriminatory behavior on the ground. Um, now, I think this is my last point now about activism. I think um, that activists who strive for uh, justice, social equality, and so on, I think we have a room full of, of people like that, um, should be very aware of problems like that. Uh, once you contribute to the construction of categories such as Roma, you are bare responsible, responsibility for the implication. And f activism for Roma, as it happens at, at this point, is very often premised on the idea that they are a national or a, transna or a transnational uh, minority. So it starts from that particular frame. So the, advo the advocates of that frame um, sort of already confirm the, the frames that are given by, by policy makers, which are often in reality detrimental to the people on the ground. So my question sort of to the, the activists who, um, on the Roma side and on the, peop and on the side of people who strive more generally for issues of social justice and social equality, is that we have to try to think of ways in which we defend the interest of certain minority groups like the Roma against marginalization in a way that does not simultaneously endorse the essentializing categorization schemes and practices that have given rise to the invention of national minority groups such as the Roma and by extension any other national outsiders. Now how to do that? I don't know. I, I think it calls for creative solutions and these creative solutions can be found, I think, in creative coalitions. Um, I'll, I, don't have, I don't have an idea how this could look like in practice, but it would be nice if there would be some sort of dialogue going on between people who strive for social justice from a left-wing perspective, like in this room, with activists who strive for um, more equality for Roma and who do that mostly in this case uh, and until, un until today from a um, ethnic perspective. This sort of um, influence from both sides, I think, or collaboration um, might reach a situation in which defending the interests of an oppressed identity group um, make that into a project which is continually somehow accompanied by an interrogation of the categorization scheme that I have constructed uh, the very identity group one is defending. It sounds a bit abstract, but in general, sort of my call would be to think creatively about the national question from a left-wing perspective, as we try to do here, to take that on board and try to start uh, that dialogue with, with these minority activists. Thanks.
better. Uh, uh, surely things you mentioned resonate also across the Balkans. Uh, uh, um, um, we will have even during the during Balkan Forum. Balkan Forum starts on Sunday uh, with parallel sessions, open parallel sessions here in this theater, and we'll have even three panels dealing with, uh, with LGBT groups and their uh, relation with the left politics or uh, somehow trying to articulate their demands within the left weak horizon, which is not that obvious in some other other uh, uh, states. So this will be quite, quite interesting. But you, you mentioned definitely outsiders and you basically what you've been talking about is the rise of fascism or maybe as our friend would say post-fascism. Uh, uh, in our, our reader, uh, Up and Underground, we just published another text by uh, uh, by our friend Tamash on post-fascism, and you come from 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 the, the country where we just these days uh, where we often uh, witness anti-Roma pogroms and where we had anti-Semitic marches and so on. And where is the left there? Right. Uh, well, first, uh, anybody from the Hungarian embassy in Zagreb, raise their hands. <laughs> Nobody. I'm surprised. Uh, because we are so paranoid about it, uh, <clears throat> that so that somebody like me talking down the country again would be considered a major attack on Hungarian territory. Now, I would not, <clears throat> I would not talk about Hungary as such, uh, but trying in a very old-fashioned and naive way to give you a cautionary tale just to show you what can happen with a non-Weimar uh, liberal state in a post-Soviet uh, time in a republic founded by the likes of me in 88-89, some responsibility there too, and which have been indeed overturned uh, by a series of events that may serve really as a lesson for the rest of you, because of course Hungary is different from the rest of East European countries by the intensity and the concentration of elements that are more loosely collected elsewhere. And here, of course, because my officially my theme is of course Europe and. Uh, and the national question or something like that, I'll say a few words because the similarities between the strategies and logistics and uh, conceptual tactics of contemp contemporary states and parastates like the European Union are pretty similar in many ways. Well, as you know, the uh, European Union uh, has come into being not completely innocent of an ideological past. It was mostly designed by French lawyers, French lawyers uh, that came from a non, not very Republican, Catholic, slightly vichyssois uh, background combined with the Napoleonic dreams of Alexandre Kojev and, uh, and such like, you know, well, Napoleonic in the sense, of course, of the uh, phenomenology of the spirit. And uh, so, the, so, so, what is, so what is common there is that both modern ethnicists and the European Union believe in the unlimited creative power of the concept. Well, you know, what did Europe mean before the European Union has become a reality? It has meant, of course, a cultural homeland uh, characterized by the superiority of the white race. Europe, as such, was very much a part of reactionary rhetoric in the 20s and in the 30s. Festung uh, Europa, yeah? It was you know, the fortress Europe. Well, it was a certain Adolf Hitler who uh, was so fond of the European idea. And they were Europeans. The Nazis always insisted that they want to create Europe, a new Europe, having got rid of the Asians, who would be, of course, the Slavs, especially the Russians, and, of course, the Jews, 
and the common element between Jews and Russians, communists. And, and now, of course, that was the fantasy, some reality to it too, but you know, mostly fantasy. And so, you know, when Europe was created, was supposed to be a bulwark against many things, mostly, of course, like such creation, always against social unrest. It was, as I said or, or, already uh, in this room before, it is very much a successor to the Holy Alliance, an aristocratic, an aristocratic alliance, uh, very much opposed, well, in this case, of course, bureaucratic and not blue blood, uh, a non-popular alliance where the cooling force of the concept you know, as opposed to the fiery heat of popular passion, you know, was indeed, no, it's, it's, it really was the idea that rational procedures, general usefulness, uh, increasing uh, living standards, and therefore, you know, giving something for the plebeians to chew, and meanwhile, of course, the, the intellectual supremos and the lawyers and the judges and the philosophers would devise a reasonable order with a semblance of a liberal order, but without a semblance of democracy. European Union is an organization which purports to be the refutation and the counterpart of popular sovereignty. This is the organization which is par excellence, opposed to popular sovereignty, especially its Jacobin Republican version. Now, uh, so of course, its relationship with nationalism is fraught, because you see, Jacobinism has a strong universal component, republicanism, classical or modern, is a very strong universalist dimension. And uh, the European Union, although, of course, opposed to the nation state, or at least face of the nation state, it's not universalist because it represents what? It represents the continuation of the supremacy of a tradition linked to a certain ethnic, racial, cultural, religious heritage. They're all vague about it, so I'll be vague too. And, uh, you know, so it's not the union of the world. It is European. It is white. And when people oppose Europe to nationalism, they should think that, what about Africans then, okay? Who uh, won't be a part of this generous anti-nationalist organization. But, so, you know, in Hungary, to most people now, influenced by the state media, which I will describe uh, uh, shortly, uh, conceive of the main conflict now as a classical conflict between cosmopolitanism and absolutism, uh, represented always, imagined to be represented always by elites, and the concrete lively, biological, empirical, national community based on physical proximity, uh, temporal propinquity, uh, tradition, uh, and uh, ethnicity or race. So the concrete as opposed to the abstract and so on. But of course the abstract of course is identified again with something. The abstract in this political mythology is, of course, associated with communism on the one hand and liberalism on the other. In this, in, in one, from one point of view, this is not so stupid. Because you see, capitalism and this abstraction and its impersonal processes are addressed on the same level of abstraction only by Marxism. All versions of anti-capitalism that are not Marxists in origin or in, in tradition, of course, are attacking capitalism uh, in uh, uh, legitimizing themselves as representing experience, the concrete, the soul, the body, you know, uh, 
uh, as opposed to the machinery of abstraction and modernity. Marxism is the only modern and conceptual weapon in, on, in this respect. They are on the same level. So a real conservative romantic reactionary will be uh, justifiably hostile to both. And this is what, well, this appeared to be something very 19e, but it, it has come back. It has uh, contemporary Hungarian ethnicism has a very strong romantic component, and uh, which of course is also uh, stressed by, by many elements. Of course, the cult of the leader and his heroic story of coming from afar, having been a sinner, a liberal, and then, of course, uh, uh, realizing uh, the, the national gospel and also other elements, mostly the divorce between the view of the Hungarian nation as being above the state. Because the Hungarian nation is conceived of all Hungarians, whether they live in Hungary or Romania or Serbia or Slovakia or the Ukraine. That is the Hungarian nation in the official ideology. So the Hungarian state is just a device. It's just a mechanical device with which we do things. But the essence, of course, is an informal group. It's an informal group defined by what? By things that don't seem to be political. Language, common origin, ethnicity, shared tradition, etc., but which in this case is not aiming at the creation of a new kind of a redemptive state or whatever, like in old nationalisms, but keeping them together beyond and transcending national borders and state institutions. So then, if you are asked what is a Hungarian, you base yourself on feeling. We know that. We know who is Hungarian. Well, just think what they think about me. Okay. And, you know, and especially that I'm also a Transylvanian, it's very complicated. And, you know, so therefore, because the legitimacy of this ethnicist or ethnic rule is not directly related to the state, so it is carefully divorced from any idea of citizenship, legitimacy comes from ethnicity and from nothing else, then of course, logically, the position of any group that is not seen somehow as national, as you said, you know, uh, gypsy or gay or whatever, um, Jewish, uh, cosmopolitan, communist, you know, European, whatever, uh, they don't constitute the legitimating community and therefore they have no place in the new nation. And because this legitimacy is not uh, civic in nature, therefore it is very easy to justify the dictatorial or semi-dictatorial or tyrannical or semi-tyrannical measures as serving the interest of a community that is difficult to identify, that's difficult to pinpoint, difficult to nail down. So therefore the, the, the legitimacy is mystical. Of course, there's something, you know, the spirit of this ethnic group living here and there and, there and somewhere else and between the leading elite. So therefore, when they, for example, will make a media law uh, in which censorship is transformed into a creative principle. So censorship is making the program. It is actually the media authorities programming commission outside radio and television in another building, a different institution, that actually creates the news. And the news, yes, and the news are given to the radio stations and broadcast without the radio people having not only control but knowledge of it. Okay? But the same institution also controls uh, in, uh, private broadcasting. And so when in, within 24 hours, 1,200 radio journalists have been fired. When oh, was this uh, after, a few days after the media law. And, uh, you know, and when 
For example, uh, there have been, I, I told some of the friends, you know, one of the most valuable part of the Hungarian media system was state-owned local radio, which indeed uh, was critical, independent of local councils and local interest groups and so on, and being cheap, it was easily made, and, and, and those people, for example, in local radio, who were local intellectuals but independent from local interest, they had a very important role. All those local radios are now made into one that broadcasts fake folk music. Not a word, okay? 24 hours of turbo folk nonsense, right? And, okay, and where would you protest? Where would you protest? There's no media outlets in which you could. And so, or when, for example, the Constitutional Court will throw out a number of laws and then the next day, Parliament will put all those laws into the Constitution because then the Constitutional Court cannot throw them out any longer. So all sorts of important and unimportant uh, uh, momentary or momentous laws are put into the Constitution, therefore humiliating any idea of a constitutional order, making it totally ridiculous. People wouldn't think in terms of a constitutional architecture that keeps the state in place, because the state does not any longer play a central role in the national imaginary. That is being replaced by the, uh, this ineffable uh, ethnic group. But then again, if the main reference group of government policy, the Hungarian, the Hungarian Dom, the Magyar Dom, or whatever, uh, is, is, the, is replacing the citizenship, the citizenry, well, then what's the role of people within Hungary who are Hungarian citizens but not ethnically Hungarian? They don't any longer, uh, they are not any longer considered to be Staatstragend. Uh, you know, <laughs> I can't say it any other language, I'm sorry. Uh, you, know, <coughs> you know, the group that carries the state that is constitu constituting the state. So therefore, it is officially recognized that an important part of the population and an important part of the political culture consists of people who are quintessentially foreign. Therefore, they have no say, not because what they say is wrong, not because what they say is destructive or subversive, but because they don't belong. And who belongs, of course, is determined by the spirit. And so, and in this respect, the most uh, semi-tyrannical ethnicism meets neoconservatism and neoliberalism and halfway, because, yes, because both are hostile to the universalist idea of the state based in modernity on idea of political equality. And, you know, so on the one hand, one is replaced against a fantasy because even in Mrs. Thatcher's country, it is not replaced, you know, the state by the markets. That's a myth. The state is there, and it's very harsh, actually, and populous. And, and, but nevertheless, the myth is that, that spontaneity, that people's aggregated individual acts, this is neoconservative view of the market, that determines in a free way collective action, i.e. politics, and in ethnicism is the same kind of myth in which uh, you know, spontaneous belongings, identities, yearnings, and, uh, and, and uh, remembrances will uh, circumscribe the sphere of correct and good political decisions and collective actions. So both are, in very different ways, of course, directed against the conceptual and the rational approach towards collective action and legitimate authority. Now, this in Hungary has led to a very Austro-Hungarian combination of uh, total chaos, 
you know, because this state is very, very harsh and very tyrannical, but, but, but bureaucratically very inept. So it's an operetta of all sorts of scandals and, and mistakes and errors and so on and so forth. And at the same time, a great determination of keeping the control of the dominant institution, institutions on individual behavior, accompanied by a great hatred of learning, a great hatred of modernist culture, a great hatred of intellectuals, a great contempt for industrial workers, uh, savage anti-communism, and a totally uh, unjustified contempt for people like yourselves, our neighbors. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Gaspar. Uh, um, this was uh, really excellent. We got an excellent overview, but um, uh, we started on a pessimistic note. We, we ended on a pessimistic note. Uh, I'm sure there will be a lot of comments. We are obviously facing sub-state nationalisms and, and, and state nationalism that are going beyond the state or basically trying to abolish the state as this uh, 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 locus of political equality, even basic political equality that is creating more and more exclusions. And it seems it's not just a Hungarian exception. It is something that's happening everywhere in Europe in one form or the other. So I'm sure you'll have a lot of comments and questions. Now the floor is yours. Thank you for the last two interesting lectures. Unfortunately, I skipped the first one and therefore I wanted to restrain myself even to ask the question. But since obviously somebody brave was missing from the audience, I decided to ask or start the discussion with a quite provocative question. It was really interesting and inspiring to listen to the last presentation. You sounded a little bit bitter and disappointed. And of course, you understood all what was bad in the society. But I was wondering how much people like us who do understand all the bad in the society actually have a power to influence those who make decisions. I mean, it's great that we see what the problems are, but the problem is if this, what see, we see as, a pro as problems is being solved by the politicians. And now when I mention those politicians, I also wonder if those who are able to influence the societal change through political decisions and political institutions are actually willing to listen. And uh, the actor that is most powerful for the time being in this transforming part of Europe, like Western Balkans and even the Central and Eastern Europe, is the EU that is setting conditions. I don't think that the EU is actually uh, open and interested enough in listening those marginal voices of people that are critical towards societal problems, marginal political, or sorry, marginal societal groups like minorities and so on. So what, what is then all the fuss about if political actors are not actually listening to critical mass of the society that it's societal minority? Thank you. Mm -hmm. we, can, we can collect some more questions now when, you know, you broke the ice. I'm quite surprised there are no questions, but okay, we'll give you some time. Maybe, maybe you can respond. Yeah, maybe you can respond right. to well, this comment. Well, first of all, uh, if we had at, around this table, if we had power, you wouldn't have come to listen mm -hmm. to us. So that's already, already one useful thing that we don't have any power. And, um, and, but, 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 but seriously, I don't think that the function of criticism and criticism even in the more decisive sense of advocacy, activism, political organization, revolution, whatever, you know, is about getting the powerful to listen. But they won't. It's what you can do is only to get the powerful less powerful. So that, that's my answer. No, they, indeed, they won't listen. They're not there to listen. And in this respect, there's a remarkable little change. In class societies, there's a limit to what the rulers can do. 
and if they want to keep class society in place. So that's still an absolute uh, 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 limit. That doesn't mean that you have to give up any kind of uh, activity within the usual parliamentary frames and so on, although I'm less and less uh, inclined to, 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 to have any hope in this system. <laughs> Nevertheless, I don't disparage those people who are you know, reformists and so on. <laughs> nevertheless, nevertheless, it is, it is the independent and autonomous activity of sections of society that will change things. You know, since the 1980s, progressive politics in the real holes of power had been lacking. So we, 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 we can't wait for these people to, 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 to mend their ways and change and get better, because it doesn't seem to be the case. There's no, there's no time. I think, I think that uh, with, the, with regard to Hungary in particular, um, the European institutions and a lot of European politicians are in fact quite critical at this moment. Uh, so there is a lot of criticism and there is an attempt at least to take the, the, the mobilizations or the activist, activisms that are happening in Hungary seriously and they even get a voice I think on the European level. The problem is that um, it seems like in the case of Orban, he manages to... Uh, gather a lot of force of, uh, within the country itself, um, do that, and at the same time sound quite pro-European towards an international audience at the same time. Uh, I don't know if this something might be related even to language in a certain sense, that if he speaks to a national audience, he can uh, mobilize all sorts of nationalist feelings and uh, anti-minority feelings and so on and so forth, and then speaking quite politically correct towards an international audience, and that international audience doesn't really understand what's happening within the, the Hungarian context. It could be an element of that. But in general, it seems that, it seems that um, um, Orban is so much supported and the opposition is so much divided in Hungary that you have a sort of status quo. But I do think that there are European politicians and European institutions quite critical of the situation in Hungary. Uh, also, with regard to the situation yeah, of the Roma in Hungary, very critical. very critical, yes, well, we have the Benz Commission and all these reports coming out. Also, uh, NGOs, uh, you have uh, reports by minority NGOs, by human rights NGOs writing about this, uh, and so on and so forth. Even the New York Times on this Paul Krugman's blog, there's very often uh, a discussion about Hungary, which is quite, uh, quite um, exceptional, that one European country is so focused on this blog, so um, there is a lot of attention, but it doesn't translate into a change uh, in the country itself, in domestic change, and that's quite, quite interesting. interesting, and we will see how this develops further. So. I will put that. Um, I guess, just speaking to the wider point about uh, politicians listening and how do you make politicians listen, I do think that some of these sub-state nationalisms and these independence movements, and from various shades, from the likes of the SNP, uh, Catalonian nationalists, to UKIP in Britain, are a reaction to a sentiment that, that people aren't listened to. And I think quite between apathy, between, you know, voter turnouts are down across Europe, uh, hugely down, and they continue to go down. And I think that, in a way, is a reaction as well to a sense that people aren't listened to. But I also think these emerging sub-state nationalisms, especially post-financial crisis, a sense of economic and political failings, I think, you know, I, Hungary is obviously a, a very extreme example of it, but I think across Europe, I do see some of these sub-state nationalisms as being a reaction to that particular point as well. It's probably worth flagging up. Very good. Some more questions, comments? Here's the one. That's you. So, uh, hello again. Hi, um, Vladimir Runkowski Korica from Mark 21 in Serbia. Um, I wanted to ask a question relating to, um, again, the history of the European Union. Um, we heard a little bit about how it came about um, as part of a, an elite project um, by Catholic lawyers from France and so on. Um, but it's also, it was also a reaction to several other um, events, uh, the collapse of the interwar state system in Europe. Um, the, uh, which had collapsed during the economic crisis. It was also an anti-Soviet um, uh, bulwark for the West, and um, in other words, it was a defense of the elites um, and of capitalism within, within 
Europe. It, so it, it, from the beginning, it was something that was uh, both trying to overcome the pre-war uh, interstate competition in order to displace it to the international realm, but also to uh, stop the um, struggle from below developing against the, uh, the elites uh, or the capitalist elites of um, Europe. Um, this has gone through various phases. I don't necessarily know all of them right now, and I'm sure that we could talk about it until the cows come home tomorrow. But, but uh, the, the major project right now, or the last 20 years or so, um, or even longer since the late 70s, has been that of European Monetary Union, um, as, among other things, an attempt at creating the European Union as a, a, an imperialist competitor level to the United States in the world. And the current crisis seems to me to be a crisis of uh, this monetary project being also a crisis of the very essence of what the European Union is trying to be. And it's one that's being manifested um, precisely uh, in cracks between uh, the, again, a resurgence of the interstate system, but also um, one where uh, democracy is, going, is having to be denied even at the nation state level. Um, we've seen that in, in Greece with the imposition um, from abroad of a technocratic government. The same thing happened in Italy and so on. We, in the Balkans, we have several states which have imposed governments from, from outside. So how does, that, uh, how does that relate to the overall national question today, if I can put it that way? Or to put it differently, what is the revolutionary potential of the national question today? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you want to you wanna respond immediately? <coughs> well, yes, for the moment, there is, of course, a counter-revolutionary potential to it. And it, it needn't rest forever like that, of course. Uh, uh, nationalism is versatile, and it has meant several things over time. And at the moment, of course, you know, uh, people are faced with several kinds of reaction. So, for example, you know, in, 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 in this country, struggling with the crisis, um, you know, they have uh, this very harsh, very heartless, and very stupid, uh, uh, you know, punishments meted out by the International Financial Organization, the European Union, uh, totally, even in terms of neoclassical economics, quite absurd measures imposed, uh, mostly determined by panic fear of collapse, which I understand. And... Um, and so that's in itself, of course, is a profoundly anti-democratic thing, not only because it is imposed from afar and without any involvement of the populations concerned, but also because it's so manifestly uh, imposed by an irresponsible elite and in the interest of other irresponsible elites. So this is class politics that is most spectacular and, uh, you know, pure. And so, and of course, and the reaction in the absence of a large emancipatory left movement, how can it be interpreted? Such a thing as, you know, crisis management by imperialist forces, you know, got half inadequate, but still conceptually not totally absurd responses while the international movement was in place. So now, of course, usually reactions are nationalistic or, you know, crudely democratic in the sense in which the common good and popular sovereignty are defined in terms of um, income only. And uh, so, so this is also something I, which I wouldn't hesitate to call decadence. This is a, a, it's a really, really a, a moral and intellectual collapse of, of politics all over the world and especially in Europe. And, uh, and, uh, and of course it is quite true that the imposition of austerity measures is very unfair. It's also biased towards the weakest partners and so on and so forth. So therefore, the old, old, old problem of the contradiction between and the hostility between weak nations and strong nations, poor nations and rich nations, is repeating itself. That's quite. And this is what is being used by such nationalist and pseudo-populists, populists, because genuine populists have something to do with the people. And these are pseudo-populists. And these pseudo-populists, of course, can indeed 
present themselves as at least the defenders of the homestead and as somebody, as some people representing the people's will and desire, most of desire. And so instead of mobilizing them, they are disarming them. So, you know, one abstract distant authority is opposed by, uh, by an activist and, 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 and a very harsh, materialistic... Uh, let me give you an example. So, you know, uh, there's work fair, as it were, in Hungary too, so you can get unemployment benefit only for three months only if you work, i.e. you are prepared to do some work that is prescribed to you and which you have no uh, right to refuse, uh, and if you do, you won't get any social assistance. Who is running this public works program? Is it the Ministry of Labor? No, it is the police. It is the police, it is the Ministry of the Interior. And so therefore, you know, it's being made accepted that anybody who falls outside, for example, doesn't have a job any longer, is legitimately classified as somebody being taken care of by the organs of direct coercion. Now, these are the poles between which European politics is moving. These are the extreme poles, of course, and many things in between. But this is really dispiriting. In this, you know, autonomous and, as it were, self-propelled uh, uh, validation of interest and thought and will, it's almost lost. As you, you mentioned it, that, that even voting numbers are going down. This is not, uh, I, I, my feeling is not that people are only disgusted and hopeless, but they have made, a, you know, quite a reasonable decision, namely that they cannot really decide things by voting. But other forms of political action don't seem to be available. And this is where an intelligent and brave intellectual left could have to respond to, could have a role. You know, other models exist and they should be shown to exist and models presented and lived and made sacrifices for. So I, I, can't, I can't imagine anything else. You have to begin somewhere. And one is, again, to say something old-fashioned, you have to present the nobility of the cause. You know, it's, we are too modest, in, uh, well, not, not as individuals, we can be very vain, vain, but I don't mean that. But we, as a movement, as a community of political actors, are too modest. Our objectives are too low. We are not inspiring anybody. We can join the choir of those who complain. But that's not enough. More questions, comments? Here's one question, Martin. Well, maybe just short, there was this situation uh, at the end of the last year where uh, left liberal to left groups were, uh, well, extremely uh, upset about the question uh, of the uh, sex education. Uh, the rightist groups, right groups and uh, the church and uh, all of that were uh, obviously uh, uh, also uh, upset uh, and uh, the government was the one, so the Ministry of Education was the one uh, pushing for the program. And so we have these uh, like uh, 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 political groups uh, basically uh, um, in, entangled in some kind of a tacit uh, conflict amongst themselves uh, and then uh, the, 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 the next big thing on the political agenda was the selling of the public resources, to, so water, forests and all of that. And the interesting uh, uh, part about that was that uh, in previous attempts of a, such a, a, a move, uh, the church has stood up uh, very strongly against the sale of um, water. And uh, of course, uh, the left liberal to left groups have also uh, are also on those positions and it, uh, I'm not sure this is the right question for this panel maybe, but uh, I think that uh, there is this crux of uh, nationalism that uh, uh, is uh, kind of uh, uh, 
making it uh, un unable for these groups. I mean, I'm not talking about a coalition, but uh, at least uh, some kind of a diversified pressure uh, on on the government. Uh, uh, I would just like to hear your thoughts about that. So different political groups that are uh, uh, um, together on some issues, but uh, on others they are really uh, at each other's throat. So, uh, let's hear some other other questions, comments. Yes, here's one, David. Hi, I'm David from Belgium. Uh, my question is uh, the question for the first Peter, the Peter talking about Scotland, who is Irish. Peter, I was intrigued by your description of left-wing nationalism in Scotland. I've um, got two questions. Do you see this elsewhere in Europe? Uh, perhaps the other two uh, speakers can, can fill up. And secondly, do, does this left-wing nationalism equally use a sort of essentialist definition of what it means to be Scottish by referring to leftist principles? Is it like in the genes of the Scots, so the argument goes to be more social democrat? So what is the, you know, the link between the left-wing elite striving for uh, Scottish independence and the discourse they develop in terms of trying to mobilize masses around their plan? Good. Uh, okay, one more question, and then, then you'll have the final round. Uh, hi. Uh, well, uh, firstly, I want to say that uh, I'm not, um, uh, how to pronounce it, uh, I don't share the same political views as most, most people here do. I'm a right-wing person, I'm a right-wing supporter, and I think that in a free world, in a democratic world, it's uh, legitimate, legitimate to be a, a right-wing supporter. And I wanted to ask, uh, ask something about uh, migration. Uh, well, um, I was thinking about that, about that a lot, and uh, I can, um, well, um, uh, uh, compare it to uh, ten laws of, uh, you know, in uh, Christian and uh, in Judea tradition, you have ten laws of uh, which God gave to Moses, and then it passed to, uh, from uh, ten, uh, ten commandments. And the first commandment said that, um, I, uh, I can translate it from Croatian to uh, English, I'm uh, your Lord and you don't need to have another Lord, uh, I'm your God and uh, you don't need to have another God um, with, uh, besides me. Before, yeah, and I would say, yeah, and I would say that uh, the first uh, commandment of uh, neoliberal capitalism is I'm a free country, I'm a free, um, uh, I'm, I'm a free market. And uh, you need to give, uh, you need to let uh, workers to, to migrate from one country to another country. And uh, when you were talking about uh, migration, you were, when you were talking about minorities, uh, for example, I can, um, I remembered about uh, our people which migrated from Herzegovina and from Bosnia during 70s to Germany. And they uh, were working there on which, what, uh, something which what we call the Baustella, they were working, uh, they were building houses, building uh, um, many things, anything, yeah, they were building anything. Construction, yeah, construction. Uh, yeah, and uh, they, will, they were doing that because uh, German people, they aren't lazy and German people also know how to build something, but our people were much uh, cheaper to do it, much cheaper. And my question really is, uh, Nowadays, in nowadays, when you are defending uh, uh, migration, when you are def defending people who are coming from one country to another country, maybe you are give, maybe you are doing favor to a neoliberal capitalism because they are uh, the one who are, I think, encouraging people to come from one country to another country to work and to lower the price of the work. I don't know if you have understand me. Sorry if my English is not as fluent as it should be. Yeah, it's my question. Okay, thank you. Um, interesting questions we got here. I think uh, it would be good that we ref maybe that you reflect upon these questions in in the order and, and give your more or less your final final statements. 
I would then uh, uh, invite Peter, Peter Damo to come here and to conclude this uh, one-day workshop uh, together with me. But um, let's hear your thoughts about these questions. Okay, well, I will address uh, uh, David's questions first, well, particularly the, the, the second one. You, you asked, uh, do we see this kind of left nationalism elsewhere in Europe? I might leave it to the other Peter and uh, Gaspar maybe to expand on that. But you actually touch on something really interesting about these essentialist notions that, like, for example, in Scotland, there is a very strong idea that Scots are inherently more socialistic uh, social um, solidar solidarity is a stronger element of Scottish life than it is in the rest of the, of the UK. That there is a particular part of it to do with the industrial heritage of Scotland, Red Clyde side. I live in Glasgow. Glasgow is a very strong left wing heritage, uh, as you might you know that that has almost become in some instances a caricature of itself. I think it hasn't always. I think there's in some senses it's great. There's really great positive things from it. In other in other senses it, it can hold it back. But it, there is an actual appeal amongst the left, more so even than on the right. Most right-wing voices in favour of Scottish independence are liable to come from an, a kind of a neo, an economic right in terms of Scotland would have more access to oil, it would have more access to lowering its, lowering its own corporation tax rates, it could be a more productive economic entity. There's not so much of this kind of uh, the idea of a Scottish nation all been encapsulated now within a state. That's not really part of the rhetoric, but more interestingly on the left there is actually more essentialist ideas around uh, solidar solidar uh, solidarity and things like that. Um, I guess broadening it out to the issue of migration, which is an interesting topic to bring up, and I think that's one of these cases I think where you see this tension between what we all are talking about, this thing called neoliberalism, we talk about all the time, as if it is one certain object that we can kind of poke and go, that's neoliberalism and that's not. And within, I think there's, migration is an area that flags up the differences and some of the tensions between what we might see as um, the demands of 21st century capitalism in terms of flexibility of labour markets, uh, hypermobility, etc., etc., but also the political demands uh, among particularly right-wing governments, but actually across Left -wing, some left-wing governments too, to, uh, to maintain the nation-state as, as a kind of as a repository of the of the national people, and I think if you look at the likes of the UKIP, the United Kingdom Independence Party, and the Conservative Party, if you just look at Britain, we have become incredibly uh, migration has become a very big issue. It's a huge political voting issue, etc. And uh, you even have the kind of what we'd see as the right-wing press, the Economist, and the Financial Times continually castigating the Conservative government, because of their increasingly draconian migration laws, it's absolutely bizarre, as, as anyone who lives in the UK would know who's, who's not a EU citizen, you have to fulfil increasingly uh, difficult uh, residency and also earning um, restrictions, uh, requirements in order to stay in the country. And I think that is a tension, I think, um, it's a tension that is actually, I think, will become more pronounced across uh, the Europe now in that between migration and uh, the demands of, of, of economic demands. And I think we are seeing that already. Yes, um, just briefly on the, the left-wing nationalism. Um, it's a tricky, it's a tricky question because you you can easily recognise all sorts of nationalisms in the European political spectrum, but it's sometimes very hard to decide whether they're left wing or right wing. With a lot of the major parties having both left wing and right wing ideas in their in their um, manifestos and in their political communication, so sometimes you would see going back for in, for example to my example of. Um, the Law and Justice Party in Poland, uh, clearly a nationalist party, certainly uh, a conservative party, but when it comes to issues of the welfare state, sometimes they are sound more left-wing than the, 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 those who are the anti-nationalists. Um, so it's, it's very much a mixed bag, and um, so it's a very complicated, uh, complicated picture, which has to do, I think, something with the fact that all of these political parties, we're talking mainly about political parties, somehow try to cater in the middle towards some sort of um, consensus idea of how a society at this time should look like. So if you go more to the radical uh, fringes, you would probably have more clear-cut uh, uh, ideas there. But then nationalism functions as a sort of uh, package of uh, a clear package for what is in fact inside the package not so clear at all. And 
in fact, that might be the reason why nationalism is so attractive as a style for, of political mobilization, because the rest of the story is just a, a combination of everything else, and it's not so easily identifiable. So thereby, symbolic issues um, like the nation become very much uh, to the, the come very much in the forefront. In fact, I think if you look at Fides. Uh, same it would, thing. Same thing, probably. Yeah, it would talk. Uh, it would, if you look at the program, you would find issues no, that you could. Talk. Yeah, you could find issues that are uh, left wing. Well, maybe you can say more about yes, that. Well, yes, well, then they're nationalizing, they're nationalizing water, uh, uh, trying electricity, natural gas, uh, all sorts of measures against foreign energy firms, yeah, but at foreign the same banks. Time, but at the same time, it, there's this claim of the Hungarian nation expands big across borders, and thereby yes, and of the course. state is not so important. But we, as a political party. Uh, are the embodiment of the Hungarian nation and so on and so forth. And of yeah. Hungarian tobacco, yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, you know, that's again, you know, was when you know, there was a huge scandal with tobacco shops that have been redistributed by the government. And when, uh, you know, the press asked in the courts that, you know, details of this deal should be disclosed before it reached the courts, Parliament voted a law that amended the, inf the Freedom of Information Act thus forbidding these documents to be available. Yeah, well, all, all in the interest of you know, national tobacco, national gas, national electricity, and national sex. And uh, <laughs> so, but, but, but again, of course, it is quite true. So, so your question, of course, is quite justified because if I would be asked, am I against uh, water and natural gas being nationalized so that the the state could keep the prices low. Am I against it? No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not against it. I don't think it's solved, it, but as a short-term measure, it's not that bad. And uh, so, indeed, uh, you know, it's a protean thing. And as long as, uh, you know, in late capitalism, power remains concentrated, economic power, uh, separated from any democratic intervention from below, the system works. Well, after all, who should have a greater experience with state capitalism than people in this room? We know perfectly well that state control over capital assets does not, uh, is not automatically conducive to equality and liberty, not to speak of socialism. And, uh, and to, you, to, your, to your question about immigration, that's an, that's an interesting and a fair question. It is quite true that if, if, if migration is liberalized, that brings down the wages. That's true, that's true. But of course, the point of view of the left is free migration and higher wages for everybody. So, whether this is realizable or not, that's another question, of course. But let me just tell you that there are still differences with all respect to conservatives. I used to be a conservative myself at one time, so I know how it feels. It feels nice. <laughs> so it's okay. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and you see, uh, you know, when the, this famous new Hungarian constitution came uh, in power, there was a modest little article inherited from God knows where that said, equal pay for equal work. That has been cut off. That's not in the Constitution any longer, because that goes against the grain of a real authoritarian system where indeed the higher instances will distribute the goodies. So, you know, if you are in favor of people, for example, taking their refuge from the poor East European countries and trying to earn some more in the West, this is not diminishing their income. It is diminishing the median income of all workers in Europe. So again, in the long run, this is no solution. True. True solution, of course, is something beyond capitalism. You cannot propose any partial, this is a very good example. It's an excellent communist argument, if you excuse me. An excellent communist argument, because it shows that within capitalism, if you help at one point, it gets worse in another point. The solution is to change all the points. Um, 
Yes, thank you very much. This was, uh, the, the, this was very rich, and I, I, I have impression we just opened up a number of questions, and I think that the whole exercise uh, t t today uh, was pointing out into into direction how complex this is and, and how urgent this question for, for the left is. So I would like um, uh, 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 now to, to invite Peter Dam, who will, will do some conc conclusionary remarks, and I would like, first of all, to thank you for this wonderful panel. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Peter, uh, um, when we started, you suggested this idea to us last year, and we were very, very happy to accept the idea to organize a workshop on nationalism and left perspectives. We've been uh, just, justly so criticized last year during the Balkan Forum for avoiding this issue for avoiding the issue of nationalism, especially in the Balkans, for avoiding uh, tackling the, 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 the national question. Um, uh, we've been also accused a bit of trying not to see that there is a divide now between the differences, uh, considerable differences between some Balkan countries, say Slovenia and Croatia, vis-a-vis Bosnia, Serbia, Kosovo, Macedonia, and so on. And many comrades who are coming here were talking about how basically their left uh, um, uh, engagement, their uh, whatever they want to do with promoting a left agenda is being blocked uh, at start by nationalistic policies. And this is certainly a problem that we, of course, did not hope to close and, and, and uh, uh, today, but at least to, to open it up. Um, I think we got a, 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 a lot of interesting interventions, more food for thought, a bit of pessimism, I have to say, uh, um, on what the left could do with this problem, a total acknowledgement that the problem, problem exists. We cannot, uh, we cannot, with everything that's happening in Greece, Hungary, and everywhere else, with nation, nationalist movement that seem to be quite dynamic, we cannot really ignore it. Uh, nationalist movements that use the left-wing uh, rhetoric, but we are not really sure are they going to, to respect it, or, such as in Scotland, uh, or they're mixing it in, in, a, in a strange cocktail of national and social, uh, a very explosive one, very effective one. Uh, um, we, of course, couldn't really grasp um, an agenda. And I think this, this will this remains an open question. What kind of resistance agenda and what kind of a positive agenda of, uh, to implement in order to avoid something that we are absolutely scared of, which is a, 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 a wave of uh, nationalistic and fasc fascist violence across Europe. So uh, uh, I, would, I would now ask you to, to share your thoughts with us about this seminar and then maybe to suggest uh, steps further. Thank you, Igor. Well, uh, first of all, you draw most of the conclusions. Uh, first of all, I, I agree with you that probably the most important uh, step forward which we managed to, to do today through this seminar is tackling this question, this national question in, in its various forms from a left perspective. As most of us know, this was more or less the, let's say, the, the belonging of, of, the, of the neoliberals. We know that they, 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 all the time, they were the ones who opened such questions, uh, especially here in, in, in former Yugoslavia, where it was them who came and uh, opened uh, various projects and programs to, to come and re-establish peace between uh, people and heal the wounds of the past and so on and so forth. And for reasons which probably were not quite openly tackled today, uh, the left avoided this uh, approaching this question. And I think the first task of this seminar, which was opening the question, was achieved. Secondly, I agree with Igor uh, that we are missing uh, the further steps. But I think 
Tackling the very question in itself opens the door for further steps. And uh, you well put it, it's about what to do, because otherwise we remain at this uh, sort of somehow pessimistic reports and exchange of information of, on, uh, uh, on the issues. On the other hand, related to what I have just said, I didn't intervene, but what uh, Gaspar has said about Hungary and what other speakers pointed out resembles quite much to what is going on in Romania. And I think it's more or less a similar picture, a similar pattern yeah, throughout Central Eastern European countries. Uh, the idea of this seminar was to uh, tackle in a critical manner the way the national question is being used by the neoliberal power to remain in power and to foster their power. I think we managed to open a door and it's up to us to make the next steps which should be more practical. Thank you, thank you very much, yes. And before we all go, I, I would like to thank to all our speakers. I would like to thank you, uh, Peter, and, and above all, I would like to thank to Vedrana Bibic, uh, the, the coordinator of Subversive Forum, for making this possible. Thank you all.